Roger Williams and his wife Mary arrived in Massachusetts in February 1631. Fresh from a fine education at Cambridge University, the 28-year-old Williams was a godly minister, according to Governor John Winthrop, whose Boston church asked Williams to become its preacher. But New England's premier Puritan church was not pure enough for Roger Williams. Williams refused the invitation and moved to Plymouth Colony, where he sought to learn the language, religion, and culture of the Narragansett Indians. Williams believed that nature knows no difference between Europeans and Americans in blood, birth, or bodies, God having made of one blood all mankind. He insisted that the colonists respect the Indians since all human beings, Christians and non-Christians alike, should live according to their consciences as revealed to them by God. Williams condemned English colonists for what he called their sin of unjust usurpation of Indian land. He believed that English claims to Indian lands were legally, morally, and spiritually invalid. In contrast, Massachusetts officials defended colonists' settlement on Indian land. Governor Winthrop declared, If we leave the Indians sufficient land for their use, we may lawfully take the rest, there being more than enough for them and us. Winthrop's arguments prevailed, but Williams refused to knuckle under. He declared, The truth is, the great gods of this world are God belly, God peace, God wealth, God honor, and God pleasure. Williams believed that the Bible obscured the word of God in mist and fog. He denounced as impure, ungodly, and tyrannical the claim that New England governments enforced God's commandments in the Bible. He argued that forcing people to attend church was false worshiping that promoted hypocrisy. The only way to become a true Christian was by God's gift of faith revealed to a person's conscience. He believed that laws regulating religious behavior amounted to, quote, spiritual rape. Governments should tolerate all religious beliefs because only God knows the truth. Massachusetts's leaders rejected Williams's arguments and banished him for his extreme and dangerous opinions. In January 1636, he fled south to Narragansett Bay, where he and his followers established the colony of Rhode Island and enshrined liberty of conscience as a fundamental principle. Although New England's leaders expelled Williams from their holy commonwealth, his dissenting ideas, in fact, arose from Orthodox Puritan doctrines, which inspired believers to read the Bible and draw their own conclusions with the guidance of educated ministers. During the 17th century, however, New England's Puritan zeal cooled and the promise of a holy New England commonwealth faded. Late in the century, the new middle colonies of New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania were founded, featuring greater religious and ethnic diversity than New England. Religion remained important throughout the colonies, but it competed with the growing faith that a better life required less focus on salvation and more attention to worldly concerns of family, work, and trade. Throughout the colonies, settlements encroached on Indian land, causing violent conflict to flare up repeatedly. Political conflict also arose among colonists, particularly in response to major political upheavals in England. By the end of the 17th century, the English monarchy exerted greater control over North America and the rest of its Atlantic empire, but the products, people, and ideas that pulsed between England and the colonies energized both. France tried to move quickly after the Spanish to secure a New World empire. In 1534, Jacques Cartier, simultaneously exploring northern North America and seeking the fabled Northwest Passage to the East Indies, discovered the St. Lawrence River and made contact with the resident Montenay, Algonquin, and Huron nations. The natives were impressed by the newcomers' ships and technology, but recoiled in horror that these hairy-faced men, who appeared to them to more closely resemble bears, drank blood and ate wood. The wine and sea biscuits, you may recall, were offered as gestures of goodwill on first contact. Attempts to establish a colony in the region were unsuccessful the 16th century ending with only the colonization of a few unclaimed Caribbean islands to establish sugar plantations. In 1603, Samuel de Champlain followed Cartier's route to the native villages of Stadacona and Hochelaga and found that disease epidemics and intertribal warfare over scarce resources had raged through the valley of the St. Lawrence. The villages were totally abandoned. 
Champlain returned in 1608 and ordered the building of a fortified village next to Stadacona that he named Quebec City, confirmed his commission as Governor General of New France, and put France on the path to empire via the fur trade. It must be stressed, however, that Indians played crucial roles in establishing the patterns and terms of that empire. Champlain began a policy of sending young traders into Indian villages to learn native languages and ways of living. He made alliances with the Algonquins, Hurons, Montanais, and other peoples to gain access to rich fur-trapping territories to the north and west, while the Indians pursued alliances with the French as a means of securing European trade goods. It was a mutually beneficial arrangement and marks a stark contrast with New Spain's relations with its subordinate and neighboring Indian peoples. However, this cooperation threatened the powerful Iroquois League to the south in present-day New York. In 1609, a group of Algonquins and Hurons with whom Champlain was traveling encountered an Iroquois war party at the southern end of Lake Champlain. The two groups engaged in a ritual exchange of insults, paddled their canoes to the shore, and lined up in preparation for battle. Traditionally, such a conflict would have involved firing arrows and hurling spears with relatively few casualties. Champlain and his French companions, however, introduced a deadly new element into American Indian warfare. Stepping forward with their guns loaded, they opened fire on the Iroquois, killing several of the startled Indians outright and putting the rest to flight. New France, based on the fur trade, needed Indian alliances to sustain it. The French offered their Catholic Christianity and metal goods in the hope of winning Indian converts, customers, and allies. Over the course of the 17th century, French explorers, missionaries, and traders made contact with Indian peoples deep in the heart of the North American continent, deepening a centuries-old rivalry with England that would erupt in intermittent warfare. The success of Champlain's initial settlement of New France in 1608 partly motivated the English to invest in the establishment of Virginia beyond its disastrous first year and inspired the Dutch to build their own foothold in North America. But let us start with New England. Puritans who immigrated to North America sought to escape the turmoil and persecution they suffered in England, long-term consequences of the English Reformation. They also wanted to build a new, orderly, Puritan version of England. They established a small settlement at Plymouth in 1620, followed later by larger settlements sponsored by the Massachusetts Bay Company. Allowed to govern themselves through royal charter, these Puritans could organize the new colonies according to their religious faith. Although many immigrants to New England were not Puritans, Puritanism remained a paramount influence in New England's religion, politics, and community life during the 17th century. The religious roots of the Puritans who founded New England reach back to the Protestant Reformation, which began in Germany in 1517. The English church initially remained within the Catholic fold. King Henry VIII, who reigned from 1509 to 1547, realized that the Reformation offered him an opportunity to break with Rome and take control of the Catholic Church in England. As you may recall, in 1534, Henry formally initiated the English Reformation. He insisted that Parliament outlaw the Catholic Church and proclaim him the only supreme head on earth of the Church of England. Henry seized the vast properties of the English Church. For example, 21 Catholic bishops in England owned over 175 palaces and houses which now belonged to the king, along with many thousand acres of land. Henry also claimed the privilege of appointing all leaders in the church hierarchy. In the short run, the English Reformation allowed Henry VIII to achieve his political goal of controlling the church. In the long run, however, the Reformation brought to England the political and religious turmoil that Henry had hoped to avoid. Henry himself sought no more than a halfway reformation. Protestant doctrines held no attraction for him. In almost all matters of religious belief and practice, he remained an Orthodox Catholic. Many English Catholics wanted to revoke the English Reformation. They hoped to return the Church of England to the Pope and to restore Catholic doctrines and ceremonies. But many other English people insisted on a genuine, thoroughgoing reformation. These people came to be called Puritans. During the 16th century, Puritanism was less an organized movement than a set of ideas and religious principles that appealed strongly to many dissenting members of the Church of England. 
they sought to eliminate what they considered the offensive features of Catholicism that remained in the religious doctrines and practices of the Church of England. For example, they wanted to do away with the rituals of Catholic worship and instead emphasize that Christians needed to follow God's commandments as revealed in the Bible. At the outset of the English Reformation, few Bibles were available to ordinary Christians and they were written in Latin, which only priests and well-educated laypeople could read. The new technology of printing and English translations of the Bible made it available for the first time to literate believers in England. All Puritans shared a desire to read the Bible and make the English church thoroughly Protestant. The Puritans came from the Marian exiles who had fled England for continental Europe at the time of Queen Mary I's persecution. Most of them found their way to Geneva, Switzerland to study the Protestant theology of John Calvin, which has come down to us as, of course, Calvinism. Calvin was originally a lawyer living in an area of southeastern France where several Protestant groups emerged in the 1520s, and at that time being a Protestant in France was a capital offense, and when Calvin became converted to Protestantism, he had to flee the country, and so found himself in Geneva, which had a governmental policy of toleration for all forms of Christianity. Abandoning the legal profession, Calvin immersed himself in biblical study and came to believe that Martin Luther had only gone partway toward what he considered to be true Christianity. Calvin began with God's omniscience and omnipotence, his being all-knowing and all-powerful, and concluded that the institutional structures and theologies of the Catholic Church, as well as the existing Protestant churches, implied something close to a disbelief in that omniscience and omnipotence when they said that performing acts of piety and good works somehow earned believers a place in heaven and helped them avoid hell. He enunciated a principle that is known as predestination, meaning that God knows where the individual's soul will go after death while he or she cannot. Calvin compiled his understanding of Christianity into a two-volume work titled the Institutes of the Christian Religion, in which he boiled everything down to five points. Number one, total inability, meaning that as finite creations of an infinite God, people have absolutely no power to determine their fate, whether it be sanctification and eternity in heaven, or damnation and eternal suffering in hell. As a matter of fact, according to Calvin, the original sin of Adam and Eve was so terrible an offense that all humanity deserves damnation for it, and that it takes a God of infinite mercy to be willing to overlook that stain of original sin in anyone and allow them into his direct presence. Number two, unconditional election, meaning that because of total human inability, that should one be counted among the saved, or the elect, that it is through God's grace alone and not through any effort on the believer's part or anything to do with their worthiness in any respect. Nothing you may have done or not done in your life has any bearing on whether you are to be saved, although it is certain that even if original sin was your only sin, and that's not possible, but just for the sake of argument, if that was your only sin, you would still be considered fundamentally unworthy of grace in God's eyes. Number three, limited atonement, meaning that Christ sacrificed himself only for the sake of the elect and nobody else. Being a lawyer, Calvin saw how the vast majority of people obey laws not because it's the right thing to do, but because they fear punishment for getting caught and are always looking for ways to break the law and get away with it. The same applies to Christian belief, he thought. People believe in God, go to church, and do good deeds not because they're the right things to do, but because they're trying to earn points towards salvation. They yearn for the mental and physical delights of heaven and are terrified of the prospect of torture and pain in hell. Whereas in Catholic theology, most souls will end up in heaven, most of them after spending a long stint in purgatory first, and only the worst sinners will go to hell, Calvin agreed with Luther that there is no such thing as purgatory, but he argued that the overwhelming majority of Christians are false Christians who will end up in hell. Believers should do good works, go to church, and help old ladies across the street, and all of those nice things, but without any expectation of receiving a reward, and never out of a desire to avoid punishment in hell for not doing them. It's like the Santa Claus song, you have to be good for goodness sake. Number four, irresistible grace, 
meaning that because of total human inability, divine grace cannot be rejected. Well, after all, who would, right? What happens when one receives grace is a transformation of one's soul such that any serious sins one may have committed in the past, he or she is now incapable of committing them again, though they will go on sinning in minor ways, and there's always the taint of original sin. Number five, the perseverance of the saints, meaning that once you receive grace, you are incapable of doing anything that would cause it to be taken away, again, because of total human inability. The thing to remember about Calvinism is that saving grace may come to anyone at any time and has nothing whatsoever to do with anything he or she may have wanted, felt, thought, or done that may have made them worthy of salvation. This means that in theory, the most terrible person imaginable may be sanctified late in life and go to heaven when they die, while one of the saintliest people you could imagine may never receive grace and end up in hell. It is extremely unlikely, but Calvin said that believers have to have faith in God's infinite quality of judgment, and that judgment cannot be doubted or questioned. The believer can understand these things, but cannot ever have the slightest assurance that they will be among the elect, while at the same time knowing deep down that, no matter what, they absolutely deserve damnation for nothing more than being born, to say nothing of the many, many sins they will have committed in their lives. This is a hard theology and is what the English Protestant exiles in Switzerland embraced and took back to England after Elizabeth I's accession in 1558. Most of them sought for a long time to further reform the Church of England along Calvinist lines, but were rebuffed at nearly every turn. These are what I call mainstream Puritans, and they were the majority of English Puritans. A splinter group soon formed, though, around a chap named Robert Brown, who decided that the Church of England was hopelessly corrupt and irredeemable, and he urged total separation from the Anglican Church, thus earning them the nickname Separatists, though they called themselves Independents. Most mainstream Puritans asserted the independence of their churches from the authority of the Archbishop of Canterbury and the monarch, and royal authorities called them Independents too, but mainstream Puritans held on to a hope that the Anglican Church would come around to Puritanism sooner or later. They had influence in Elizabeth's court, but just enough to keep them from being a nuisance. When Elizabeth's successor, James I, became king, English Puritans petitioned for further reform of the Church of England. James authorized a new translation of the Bible, known ever since as the King James Version. However, Neither James I nor his son, Charles I, who became king in 1625, was receptive to the ideas of Puritan reformers. James and Charles moved the Church of England away from Puritanism. They enforced conformity to the Church of England and punished dissenters. In 1629, Charles I dissolved Parliament, where Puritans were well represented, and initiated aggressive anti-Puritan policies. Many Puritans despaired about continuing to defend their faith in England and made plans to immigrate to Europe, the West Indies, or America. One of the first Protestant groups to immigrate, later known as Pilgrims, were the Separatists. In 1608, they moved to Holland. By 1620, they realized that they could not live and worship there as they had hoped. William Bradford, a Separatist leader, recalled that, quote, many of their children, by the great licentiousness of youth in Holland and the manifold temptations of the place were drawn away by evil examples, end quote. Bradford and other separatists believed that America promised to better protect and preserve their children and their community as Englishmen. Separatists obtained permission to settle in the extensive territory granted to the Virginia Company. In August 1620, Pilgrim families boarded the Mayflower, and after 11 weeks at sea, all but one of the 102 immigrants arrived at the outermost tip of Cape Cod in present-day Massachusetts. Right there. The Pilgrims realized immediately that they had landed far north of the Virginia Grants and had no legal authority to settle in the area. To provide order, security, and a claim to legitimacy, they drew up the Mayflower Compact on the day that they arrived. They pledged to, quote, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation, end quote. The signers, all men, agreed to enact and obey necessary and just laws. 
the Pilgrims settled at Plymouth and elected William Bradford their governor. That first winter, which they spent aboard their ship, was most sad and lamentable, Bradford wrote later. Quote, In two or three months' time, half of our company died, being the depth of winter and wanting houses and being infected with scurvy and other diseases. End quote. In the spring, Indians rescued the floundering Plymouth settlement. First Samoset and then Squanto befriended the settlers. Samoset had learned English from previous contacts with sailors and fishermen who had visited the coast to dry fish before the Plymouth settlers arrived. Squanto had been kidnapped by an English trader in 1614 and taken as a slave to Spain, where he escaped to London and learned English before finally making his way back home. Samoset arranged for the pilgrims to meet and establish good relations with Massasoit, the chief of the Wampanoag Indians, whose territory included Plymouth. Squanto, Bradford wrote, quote, was a special instrument sent of God for their good. He directed them how to set their corn, where to take fish, and to procure other commodities, end quote. With the Indians' guidance, the pilgrims managed to harvest enough food to guarantee their survival through the coming winter, an occasion they celebrated in the fall of 1621 with a feast of thanksgiving attended by Massasoit and other Wampanoags. Plymouth Colony remained precarious for years, but the Pilgrims persisted, living simply and coexisting in relative peace with the Indians. By 1630, Plymouth had become a small permanent settlement, but it failed to attract many other English Puritans. In 1629, shortly before Charles I dissolved Parliament, a group of Puritans obtained a royal charter for the Massachusetts Bay Company. The charter provided the usual privileges granted to joint stock companies, including land for colonization that spanned present-day Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, and upstate New York. A unique provision of the charter allowed the government of the Massachusetts Bay Company to be located in the colony rather than in England, which helped to avoid royal oversight. With this permission, Puritan immigrants exchanged their status as a harassed minority in England for self-government as an empowered majority in Massachusetts. John Winthrop, a prosperous lawyer and landowner, led the immigrants and became governor of the new colony. In March 1630, 11 ships crammed with 700 passengers sailed for Massachusetts. Six more ships and another 500 immigrants followed a few months later. Unlike the separatists, Winthrop's Puritans aspired to reform the corrupt Church of England rather than separate from it by setting an example of godliness in the new world. Winthrop proclaimed the cosmic significance of their journey in a sermon aboard the ship Arbella while still at sea, one of the most famous sermons in American history. The Puritans had entered into a covenant with God, an agreement that meant that the Puritans had to make extraordinary efforts to, quote, bring into familiar and constant practice, end quote, religious principles that most people in England ignored. To achieve their pious goals, the Puritans had to subordinate their individual interests to the common good. We must delight in each other, he said. Make others condition our own. Rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together, always having before our eyes our commission and community in the work as members of the same body. So shall we keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The Lord will be our God and delight to dwell among us as his own people and will command a blessing upon us in all our ways. We shall find that the God of Israel is among us when ten of us shall be able to resist a thousand of our enemies, when he shall make us a praise and glory that men shall say of succeeding plantations, the Lord make it like that of New England. For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill, the eyes of all people are upon us. That belief shaped 17th century New England as profoundly as tobacco shaped the Chesapeake. Winthrop's vision of a city on a hill fired the Puritans' fierce determination to keep their covenant and live according to God's laws, unlike the backsliders and compromisers who accommodated to the Church of England. Their resolve to adhere strictly to God's plan charged nearly every feature of life in 17th century New England with a distinctive high-voltage piety. Winthrop chose to settle on the peninsula that became Boston, and other settlers clustered at promising locations nearby. Unlike the early Chesapeake settlers, the first Massachusetts Bay colonists encountered few Indians because the local population had been almost entirely eradicated by an epidemic. Still, many of the colonists succumbed to diseases. 
During the first year, more than 200 settlers died, including one of Winthrop's sons and 11 of his servants. Winthrop himself remained confident and optimistic, and each year from 1630 to 1640, ship after ship followed in the wake of Winthrop's fleet, bringing more than 20,000 new settlers. Often, when the Church of England cracked down on a Puritan minister in England, he and many of his followers moved together to New England. Smaller groups of English Puritans moved to the Chesapeake and elsewhere in the colonies. By 1640, New England had one of the highest ratios of preachers to population in all of Christendom. Several ministers sought to bring Christianity to the Indians, but the colonists focused far less on saving Indian souls than on saving their own. The occupations of New England immigrants reflected the social origins of English Puritans. On the whole, the immigrants came from the middle ranks of English society. The vast majority were either farmers or tradesmen. Indentured servants, whose numbers dominated the Chesapeake settlers, accounted for about a fifth of those headed for New England. Most New England immigrants paid their way to Massachusetts. They were encouraged by the promise of bounty in New England. In contrast to Chesapeake newcomers, New England immigrants usually arrived as families. In fact, more Puritans came with family members than did any other group of immigrants in all of American history. Unlike immigrants to the Chesapeake, women and children made up a solid majority in New England. As Winthrop reminded the first settlers in his Arbella sermon, each family was a little commonwealth that mirrored the hierarchy among all God's creatures. Just as humankind was subordinate to God, so young people were subordinate to their elders, children to their parents, and wives to their husbands. The immigrants' family ties reinforced their religious beliefs with the interlocking institutions of family, church, and community. The New England colonies avoided the extended problems of early Virginia, for example, because every wave of settlers came with a variety of needed skill sets and were not individualists looking to make a quick fortune. The New England colonists, unlike their counterparts in the Chesapeake, settled in small towns, usually located on the coast or by a river. Massachusetts Bay colonists founded 133 towns during the 17th century, each with one or more churches. Church members' fervent piety, supported by the institutions of local government, enforced remarkable conformity in the small New England settlements. During the century, tensions within the Puritan faith and changes in New England communities splintered religious orthodoxy and weakened Puritan zeal. By 1700, however, Puritanism remained a distinctive influence in New England. Puritans believed that a church consisted of men and women who had entered a solemn covenant with one another and with God. Each person who wanted to join the church had to persuade existing members that she or he had fully experienced conversion and could abide by the covenant. Let me take a moment to dispel an important myth surrounding the Puritans. The image that we have in our minds about them is inspired mainly by the austere portrait of John Winthrop, which has given us the notion of Puritans as all dressed in black and behaving like a much less upbeat Ned Flanders from The Simpsons. The tall hats that they are famous for having worn was just the fashion for men's headgear in early 17th century England, but it has come down to us as a particular affectation of the Puritans and is the logo for the Massachusetts Turnpike Authority. The image we often have of Puritans is of dour killjoys who were overly obsessed with their personal religiosity, incapable of enjoying life for fear of being sinful, constantly looking to correct a neighbor's ungodly behavior, riddled with phobias about sexuality, highly superstitious, and terrified that there were witches seeking to do them harm. This is an extreme exaggeration. Yes, they were very religious, and perhaps a bit more so than most Englishmen at the time, but they were surprisingly relaxed in their attitudes toward the everyday living of life. The ministers often wore black suits because that was a standard sort of uniform that all Christian clergy in Europe wore back then, and sometimes still do. Everyone else had wardrobes that were as varied as the limited ability for people at that time to afford and buy more than a few sets of clothes would have, and in a wide variety of colors too, some of them quite vibrant. They did believe that one's dress should not be overly decorative and flamboyant, so in that sense they were conservative, but certainly they were not all dressed in black and dark brown, and women were certainly enjoined to maintain a degree of modesty in their dress, as opposed to the very wealthy, who often dressed ostentatiously and, for the time, provocatively. 
they believed that God had created a world with delights that the properly worshipful person may indulge as long as it did not distract from spiritual concerns. So it was okay to drink alcohol so long as you didn't drink to excess, to eat rich foods as long as it was in moderation, and take pleasure in certain pastimes as long as they did not encourage sinfulness. They were opposed to the theater, but they very much enjoyed music, though they did believe that dancing was too carnal an activity. They are infamous for banning the celebration of Christmas and Easter, for instance, but only because they correctly argued that the date of Christ's birth is not precisely given in the Bible because it is not important, and, as with Easter, these holidays seem to be excuses for sinful activities, specifically gluttony and drunkenness. Lovemaking, so long as it was between a husband and wife for the purposes of creating children, is a pleasurable activity that is to be enjoyed, again, so long as it did not veer into practices beyond copulating in the so-called missionary position. They lived in the midst of the scientific revolution, and for them, science served to confirm their faith in a god who was the master craftsman who created a perfect clockwork Newtonian universe operating under natural laws of which God is the author. What science could not explain, they would resort to the divine or the supernatural for explanation, though, like all of the Protestants, they disbelieved in miracles. Whatever appeared to be miraculous could either be explained scientifically or only seemed miraculous due to an error on the part of the perceiver. They did believe that God permitted certain wonders, signs, and omens to take place, but only as an indirect means of communication to people, whether they be individuals, groups, communities, or nations. Satan was certainly a dreaded presence in the material world, and he could do all sorts of mischief through his demons and earthly agents. For the New Englanders, those would be Indians, non-Puritans, and witches, but only because God permitted Satan to do such mischief. Consequently, the meeting house that stood at the geographic center of most New England villages and towns was not just a community focus, but a spiritual refuge, and the minister an indispensable guide but not the ultimate authority in any given church. Since members of Puritan churches fervently hoped that God had chosen them to receive eternal life, they tried hard to demonstrate saintly behavior. To live up to their covenant, they had to help one another and discipline the entire community to behave according to saintly standards. Church members kept an eye on the behavior of everybody in town. By overseeing every aspect of life, the visible saints enforced a remarkable degree of conformity in Puritan communities. Total conformity, however, was never achieved. Ardent Puritans differed among themselves, as Roger Williams demonstrated. Non-Puritans shirked the saints' rules, such as the Massachusetts servant who declared that, quote, If hell were ten times hotter, I would rather be there than I would serve my master. End quote. It is worth noting that the population of Massachusetts and Plymouth was majority non-Puritan, though Puritans maintained exclusive control over the government and the religious life of the colony. Puritan churches in both England and New England operated on a model known as Congregationalism, which means that the church was headed by the minister on one side and by the elders of the congregation on the other side. The elders were usually the oldest and most respectable members of the community who were, of course, members of that church. To become a church member, one had to have had a conversion experience at some point past the age of seven. If you believe that this has happened to you, you would approach your minister and relate your experience to him, and if he believed it to be valid, he would then summon a few of his ministerial colleagues from surrounding towns, and you would retell your story to them, after which they might ask you a few questions about theology. If you satisfied them as to the validity of your conversion and your grasp of Calvinist theology, then you would write up a confession of sins and a profession of faith that you would then read out loud to, or the minister might read out loud, to the entire congregation. A typical church congregation would be made up of members and non-members alike, the latter having not yet experienced true conversion, but certainly hoping that such a thing would happen to them at some point. The male members of the congregation would then vote yay or nay about your application for membership, with the majority vote carrying the day. If you were voted down, that was not the end for you. The minister would advise you to pray and meditate on the matter and reapply at a later date. As you may have noticed, I mentioned that church membership applicants were expected to write their conversion narratives down. 
One of the great legacies of the Protestant Reformation was Luther's conviction that all Christians should be taught to read and write so that they can read the Bible for themselves, and English Puritans took this very seriously, with the result that literacy rates in New England in the early decades of colonization were surprisingly high, upwards of 60% for men and around 50% for women, and this rose steadily upward through the 16 and 1700s. Despite the importance of religion, churches played no direct role in the civil government of New England communities. Puritans did not want to mirror the Church of England, which they considered a puppet of the king rather than an independent body that served the Lord. They were determined to insulate New England churches from the contaminating influence of the civil government and its merely human laws. Ministers were prohibited from holding government office. Puritans had no qualms, however, about their religious beliefs influencing New England governments. As much as possible, the Puritans tried to bring public life into conformity with their view of God's law. For example, fines were issued for Sabbath-breaking activities such as working, traveling, ice skating, playing the flute, smoking a pipe, and visiting neighbors. It is only slightly exaggerated to say that Puritans governed 17th century New England for Puritanism. The charter of the Massachusetts Bay Company empowered the company's stockholders, known as freemen, to meet as the general court and make the laws needed to govern the company's affairs. The colonists transformed this arrangement for running a joint stock company into a structure for governing the colony. Hoping to ensure that godly men would decide government policies, the general court expanded the number of freemen in 1631 to include all male church members. Only freemen had the right to vote for governor and other officials. When the size of the general court grew too large to meet conveniently, the freemen agreed in 1634 that each town would send two deputies to the general court to act as the colony's legislative assembly. All other men were classified as inhabitants who had the right to vote, hold office, and participate fully in town government. Note that the right to vote and hold civil office was dependent on church membership. This was a problem Roger Williams had with the government of Massachusetts Bay Colony in particular. Even though ministers were forbidden from holding political office, the only way to, uh, to vote or obtain political office was through the church, and so one of his complaints was that Massachusetts Bay Colony was a theocracy, that is, ruled by religious leaders. This was technically untrue, but in the operations of the government of Massachusetts Bay and later Plymouth, this was a functional truth and one that he made sure was not a part of the Rhode Island colony's uh, system of government. A town meeting was composed of a town's inhabitants and freemen who chose the selectmen who administered local affairs. New England town meetings routinely practiced a level of democratic participation that had no equal elsewhere in the world. Almost every adult man could speak out and vote in town meetings, but all women, even church members, were prohibited from voting. This widespread political participation tended to reinforce conformity to Puritan ideals. The general court granted land for town sites to pious petitioners once the Indians agreed to give up their claims to the land, usually in exchange for manufactured goods or through outright chicanery. Town founders then apportioned land among themselves and any newcomers they approved. Most family plots were 50 to 100 acres, causing land in New England to be much more equally distributed than in the Chesapeake. The physical layout of New England towns encouraged settlers to look inward toward their neighbors, multiplying the opportunities for godly vigilance. Most people considered the forest that lay just beyond every settler's house an alien environment. Footpaths connecting one town to another were so poorly marked that even John Winthrop once got lost and spent a sleepless night in the woods only a half mile from his house. Almost from the beginning, John Winthrop and other leaders had difficulty enforcing their views of Puritan orthodoxy on a non-Puritan majority population. In England, persecution as a dissenting minority unified Puritan voices in opposition to the Church of England. In New England, however, the promise of a godly society and the Puritans' emphasis on individual Bible study led toward different visions of godliness. New England's leaders believed that dissenters, like Roger Williams, who disagreed with their religious and political order, were wrong. Dissent must be caused either by mistaken beliefs or by the evil power of Satan. Accordingly, dissent was intolerable. A few years after arriving in Massachusetts, 
Winthrop confronted dissenter Anne Hutchinson, a devout Puritan woman steeped in scripture and absorbed by religious questions. The mother of 14 children, Hutchinson assisted neighboring women during childbirth. In 1634, she began to give weekly lectures about recent sermons delivered by local ministers. The people who gathered at Hutchinson's home listened to her preach about the covenant of grace, the idea that the only way individuals could be saved was by God's grace in choosing them to be members of the elect. Hutchinson contrasted this particular Puritan doctrine with the covenant of works, the belief that a person's behavior, one's good deeds, could win God's favor and ultimately earn a person's salvation, a view Puritans believed was wrong and sinful. The meetings at Hutchinson's house alarmed her nearest neighbor, Governor Winthrop, who believed that she was undermining the good order of the colony. In 1637, Winthrop had formal charges brought against Hutchinson and denounced her lectures as, quote, not tolerable nor comely in the sight of God nor fitting for your sex, end quote. A leading minister told her, you have stepped out of your place. You have rather been a husband than a wife and a preacher than a hearer and a magistrate than a subject. This brings up the question of where was Mistress Hutchinson's husband in all of this? In an ordinary Puritan family, he would be expected to exert absolute control over his wife, and the fact that he appeared not to do so would indicate either, one, that he was a weak-willed sort of man incapable of having mastery in his household, or, as I'm more inclined to believe, that he was thoroughly supportive of her. Winthrop and other Puritan elders referred to Hutchinson and her followers as antinomians, people who believed that Christians could be saved by faith alone and did not need to act in accordance with God's law as set forth in the Bible and as interpreted by the colony's leaders wherever it may conflict with their personal consciences. Hutchinson nimbly defended herself against the accusation of antinomianism. Yes, she acknowledged, she believed that men and women were saved by faith alone, but no, she did not deny the need to obey God's law. Quote, the Lord hath let me see which was the clear ministry and which the wrong, she said. How could you tell which ministry was which, Winthrop asked. By an immediate revelation, she replied, by the voice of God's own spirit to my soul. Winthrop seized this statement as the heresy of prophecy, the view that God revealed his will directly to a believer instead of exclusively through the Bible, as every right-minded Puritan knew. In 1638, the Boston Church formally excommunicated Hutchinson. In 1638, the Boston Church formally excommunicated Hutchinson. Banished, the Hutchinsons and their followers moved first to Roger Williams' Rhode Island, and the Hutchinsons eventually wound up in Long Island, where she and most of her family were killed by Siwanoi Indians. The strains within Puritanism, exemplified by dissenters like Anne Hutchinson and Roger Williams, caused communities to splinter repeatedly during the 17th century. Thomas Hooker, a prominent minister, clashed with Winthrop and other leaders over the composition of the church. Hooker argued that men and women who lived godly lives should be admitted to church membership even if they had not experienced conversion. In 1636, Hooker led an exodus of more than 800 colonists from Massachusetts to the Connecticut River Valley where they founded Hartford and neighboring towns. In 1639, the towns adopted the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut, a quasi-constitution that could be changed only by the vote of freemen, who did not have to be church members, although nearly all of them were. Other Puritan churches divided and subdivided throughout the 17th century as acrimony developed over doctrine, theology, and church government. Sometimes churches split over the appointment of a controversial minister or over a minister's particular interpretation of theology and doctrine. These divisions arose from uncertainties and tensions within Puritan belief. As the colonies matured, other tensions surfaced. As English settlers arrived at an increasing rate, Indian people found themselves pushed off their lands, deprived of game, and cheated in trade. Smallpox struck the Indians of New England in 1633 and 34, and Governor William Bradford of Plymouth Plantation reported a mortality rate of 95% among Indians on the Connecticut River. The Pequot Indians of southern Connecticut suffered appalling losses in the epidemic. The Pequots were a once powerful people whose location at the mouth of the Connecticut River allowed them to control the region's trade in wampum, strings of shells used in intertribal trade and diplomacy. 
Two years after the epidemic, the English went to war against the Pequots. The Pequot War has been a source of controversy among historians. Some blame the Pequots. Others see it as an act of genocide on the part of the English. A scholar of the conflict concludes that it was, quote, the messy outgrowth of petty squabbles over trade, tribute, and land, end quote, among various Indian tribes, Dutch traders, and English Puritans. The Puritans, however, transformed it into a mythic struggle between savagery and civilization. A Puritan army broke Pequot resistance in a surprise attack on their main village in 1637. Surrounding the palisaded village, the soldiers put the Pequot's lodges to the torch and shot or cut down the people who tried to escape. Hundreds died in the ensuing slaughter. The English hunted down the survivors, executing some, selling women and children into slavery, and handing over others to the Mohegans and Narragansetts who had assisted the English in the war. At the Treaty of Hartford in 1638, the English terminated Pequot sovereignty and outlawed the use of the tribal name. A revolutionary change in the fortunes of Puritans in England had major consequences in New England. Disputes between King Charles I and Parliament, which was dominated by Puritans, escalated in 1642 to civil war in England, a conflict known as the Puritan Revolution. Parliamentary forces led by the staunch Puritan Oliver Cromwell were victorious. They beheaded Charles I in 1649 and proclaimed England a Puritan Republic. From 1649 to 1660, England's rulers were Puritans and their supporters. When the Puritan Revolution began, the stream of immigrants to New England dwindled, creating hard times for the colonists. They could no longer consider themselves a city on a hill that set a godly example for humankind. Puritans in England, not New England, were reforming English society. Also, when immigrant ships seldom came, the colonists faced sky-high prices for scarce English goods and few customers for their own colonial products. When they searched to find new products and markets, they established the endearing patterns of New England's economy. New England's rocky soil and short growing season ruled out cultivating the southern colonies' crops of tobacco and rice that found ready markets in Atlantic ports. Exports that New Englanders could not get from the soil they took instead from the forest and the sea. By the 1640s, fur-bearing animals had become scarce unless fur trappers and traders went far beyond the frontiers of English settlement. Trees from the seemingly limitless forests of New England proved a longer-lasting resource. Masts for ships and staves for barrels of Spanish wine and West Indian sugar were crafted from New England timber. Fish were the most important New England export. Dried, salted codfish from the rich North Atlantic fishing grounds found markets in southern Europe and the West Indies. The fish trade also stimulated colonial shipbuilding and trained generations of fishermen, sailors, and merchants. But the lives of most New England colonists revolved less around fish, fur, and timber than around their farms, churches, and families. Although immigration came to a standstill in the 1640s, the colonial population continued to boom, doubling about every 20 years. In New England, almost everyone got married, and women often had eight or nine children. Long, cold winters reduced warm weather diseases such as malaria and yellow fever, making the death rate lower than in the South. By the end of the 17th century, the total New England population of about 100,000 roughly equaled that in the Southern colonies. Looking at this chart, note how quickly the New England and Southern colonies populations grew after 1630. These numbers are just estimates based on incomplete data, but notice the numbers and percentages in red. These refer to the African and African American proportion of the total numbers. Indian population numbers, of course, were not systematically tracked. During the second half of the 17th century, under the pressures of steady population growth and participation in the Atlantic economy, the red-hot piety of the Puritan founding generation cooled. After 1640, the population grew faster than church membership. Boston's churches in 1650 could house only about a third of the city's residents. By the 1680s, women made up the majority of church members throughout New England. In some towns, only 15% of the adult men belonged to churches, although church attendance by 1648 had become a matter of law. A growing fraction of New Englanders, especially men, practiced what historian John Butler called horse-shed Christianity, meaning that they attended sermons but afterward loitered outside near the horse-shed, 
gossiping about the weather, fishing, their crops, or the scandalous behavior of neighbors. Most alarming to Puritan leaders was that many of the children of the visible saints of Winthrop's generation failed to experience conversion and become full church members. Puritans tended to assume that sainthood was inherited, that there was a good chance the children of visible saints were also among the elect. As these children grew up during the 1640s and 50s, however, they seldom experienced the inward transformation of being born again that signaled conversion and qualification for church membership. The problem of declining church membership and the watering down of Puritan orthodoxy became urgent during the 1650s when the children of saints, who had grown to adulthood in New England but had not experienced conversion, began to have their own children. Their sons and daughters, the grandchildren of Winthrop's generation of founders, could not receive the protections that baptism afforded against the terrors of death because, according to church rules, their parents had not experienced conversion. Puritan churches debated what to do. To allow anyone, even the child of a saint, to become a church member without conversion was an unthinkable retreat from fundamental Puritan doctrine. In 1662, Massachusetts ministers reached a compromise known as the Halfway Covenant. Unconverted children of saints would be permitted to become halfway church members. Like regular church members, they could baptize their infants. But unlike full church members, they could not take communion or have voting privileges in the church. The Halfway Covenant generated a controversy that sputtered through Puritan churches for the remainder of the century. With the Halfway Covenant... Puritan churches came to terms with the lukewarm piety that had replaced the founder's burning zeal. Nonetheless, New England communities continued to enforce piety with holy rigor. Beginning in 1656, small bands of Quakers, members of the Society of Friends, as they called themselves, began to arrive in Massachusetts. Quakers believed that God spoke directly to each individual through an inner light, and that individuals did not need either a preacher or the Bible to discover God's word. Maintaining that all human beings were equal in God's eyes, Quakers refused to conform to mere human creations such as laws and government unless God demanded it. Women often took a leading role in Quaker meetings in contrast to Puritan congregations where women remained subordinate although they greatly outnumbered men. Here we have the dreaded antinomians that John Winthrop believed and Hutchinson was, and indeed a great many of Hutchinson's followers did become Quakers. New England communities treated Quakers with ruthless severity. In the years between 1659 and 1661, in fact, four Quakers were hanged by Boston officials. New Englanders' partial success in realizing the promise of a godly society ultimately undermined the intense appeal of Puritanism. In the pious Puritan communities of New England, leaders tried to eliminate sin. In the pious Puritan communities of New England, leaders tried to eliminate sin. In the process, they diminished the sense of complete human depravity that was the wellspring of Puritanism. New England's Puritans had been initially very excited about the Puritan dictatorship under Oliver Cromwell that began after the conclusion of the English Civil War, but those handfuls of New England Puritans who left to live in Old England soon found to their dismay that their confreres across the ocean had gone soft. They were on more or less friendly terms with Presbyterians and Baptists and refused to persecute, much less prosecute, Quakers, and so those who could afford it returned to New England and gave up their last remaining hopes that the English Reformation would ever reach its preferred destination in Calvinism. They were hardly surprised when in 1660, upon the collapse of Oliver Cromwell's government shortly after his death, that Parliament invited the executed king's son, also named Charles, to take the throne as King Charles II. The Stuart dynasty was reestablished in what became known as the Restoration, and Puritan New Englanders, who still held to the strength of first-generation piety, despaired for their homeland's future. They noticed declining public piety and the gradual weakening of Calvinist theology and practice, of which the halfway covenant was an obvious sign, and further events began to confirm for them that God had a bone to pick with his chosen people in the wilderness, and that he allowed Satan to unleash Indians and witches upon them as a scourge. After Massasoit made peace with the English in 1621, he worked to preserve it. 
colonists and Indians became, to a degree, economically interdependent. Even the Puritan War against the Pequots of Connecticut did not spill over into conflict with the Wampanoags. Ongoing rivalries divided the Mohegans, Narragansetts, and other tribes, and native leaders like Ninigret, Sachem of the Narragansetts, and Niantics from the mid-1630s through the mid-1670s worked to maintain the balance of power in both Indian colonial and intertribal relations. Indians and English settlers managed for a time to share the same world, but Puritans held to the belief that Indians were heathen savages and continued to trespass on Indian lands. Relations rapidly deteriorated after Massasoit's death in 1661. His son, Wamsuda, whom the English called Alexander, continued his father's policy of selling lands to the English, but in 1662, fearing they could not control the young Sachem, the Plymouth colonists brought Wamsuda to Plymouth at gunpoint for questioning. Wamsuda was ill, and the colonists released him, but kept his two sons as hostages. The ordeal proved too much for their leader, and he died on the way home. Many Wampanoags believed the Puritans had poisoned their sachem. Wamsuda's younger brother, Metacomet, called King Philip by the English, now became the leader of his people at a critical juncture. The Puritans continued to encroach on Wampanoag land and to assert their judicial authority over Indian actions. Indian hunters found themselves being arrested and jailed for trespassing on lands the English now claimed as their own. As the Indians displayed growing resentment, the colonists in 1671 demanded that Metacomet surrender the Wampanoag's weapons. Metacomet was backed into a corner. I am determined not to live until I have no country, he said. The Plymouth colonists and the Wampanoag squared off for a fight. Rumors of impending war flew through the settlements. In December of 1674, John Sassaman, a Christian Indian, reported to Plymouth Governor John Winslow that Metacomet was preparing for war. Hardly a surprising bit of information. But the next month, Sassaman was found under the ice of a frozen pond with a broken neck. In June, the Puritans seized three Wampanoags and charged them with Sassaman's murder. The evidence was flimsy, but a Plymouth jury found the men guilty and executed them. Indians sat on the jury, but they had no vote. It was the first time the English had executed an Indian for a crime committed against another Indian and a major assault on Wampanoag sovereignty. Metacomet began to forge a multi-tribal coalition, and Indians and colonists steeled themselves for war. An Indian was shot as he ransacked a colonist's house. A party of Indians retaliated by killing a colonist and his son. Metacomet withdrew from his home in present-day Rhode Island at Montauk, or Mount Hope to the English, and took refuge with Wamsuda's widow, Wedemu, the female sachem of the Pocasets. Some Indian people faced difficult decisions and divided loyalties as the impending war threatened to sever ties they had built with English neighbors over the previous generation. Wedemu seems to have been reluctant to commit to war, but many of her warriors rallied to Metacomet, as did most Nipmucks in central Massachusetts. Aligning with the English, Awashunkas, Sachem of the Sakonets of Rhode Island, put her people under the protection of the Plymouth Colony. The Mohegan Sachem, Uncas, supported the English, as he had in the Pequot War, as a way of preserving Mohegan autonomy and enhancing his own position. The powerful Narragansetts declared their intention to remain neutral, and many of Metacomet's followers sent their women and children to take refuge with them. Individuals from Natick and other Christianized Indian towns had given the English warnings of the brewing crisis and assisted them during the war as scouts, informants, and soldiers. But the English feared all Indians, and as the war spread, they incarcerated more than 500 Christian Indians from the praying towns on Deer Island in Boston Harbor. Without adequate food or shelter during the winter of 1675-76, many of them died. Scattered acts of violence escalated into the brutal conflict known as Metacomet's War. Metacomet's warriors ambushed English militia companies and burned English towns. In November 1675, the English declared war against the Narragansetts, interpreting their offer of sanctuary to non-combatants from other tribes as an act of hostility. The next month, 
an English army of more than a thousand men marched through deep snow and attacked the main Narragansett stronghold near Kingston, Rhode Island. Hundreds of Narragansett men, women, and children died in what became known as the Great Swamp Fight. An Englishman, Joshua Teft, who had an Indian wife and was in the Narragansett stronghold at the time of the attack, was captured, hanged, drawn, and quartered by the Puritans. The surviving Narragansetts joined Metacomet's War of Resistance. Both sides suffered terribly that winter from cold and hunger. English homes lay in ruins and fields lay barren. Puritan ministers thundered from pulpits that the war was God's way of punishing his sinful people. Disease broke out in the Indian camps. Metacomet tried to broaden the conflict by bringing in the Mahicans and Abenakis. Governor Edmund Andrews of New York prevailed upon the Mohawks to attack Metacomet's army in his winter camps, a devastating blow to the Wampanoag Alliance, which now found itself fighting on two fronts. In February 1676, English troops found a note nailed to a post outside Medfield, Massachusetts that conveyed the native point of view. Know by this paper that the Indians that thou hast provoked to wrath and anger will war this twenty-one years, if you will. There are many Indians yet. We come three hundred at this time. You must consider the Indians lost nothing but their life. You must lose your fair houses and cattle. That same month, the Indians attacked and burned Lancaster, Massachusetts. They took two dozen prisoners, including Mary Rowlandson, who later produced a narrative of her experience as a captive with Metacomet's army as the war was slipping away from the Indians. The tribal coalition was falling apart and Indian resistance was faltering. In April, the colonists captured the Narragansett Sachem Canonchet and handed him over to their Mohegan allies for execution. In May, Captain William Turner attacked an Indian encampment at Peskiumpskut, now Turner's Falls, Massachusetts, where families had gathered for springtime fishing on the Connecticut River. Surprising the camp at dawn, Turner's men killed hundreds of people. Captain Benjamin Church, effectively applying Indian tactics of guerrilla warfare, harried Metacomet's remaining followers. That summer, he captured Metacomet's wife and nine-year-old son and sent them to Plymouth for trial. They were probably sold as slaves to the West Indies. On the night of August 11th, Church and his men, including some Indian allies, caught up with Metacomet. Jolted from sleep, Metacomet ran for safety but was shot and killed by a Christian Indian. Church ordered his head cut off and his body cut into quarters. The head and hands were gifted to the Christian Indian as a reward for his service, and he promptly sold these trophies to the Plymouth Colony for... 30 shillings. The head was placed on a pike just outside the town limits of Plymouth, while the hands were sent on a tour of Indian villages throughout New England as a grim warning about any future prospect of Indian resistance. Even after the leader's death, the war continued along the coast of Maine, but Indian power and independence in southern New England were broken. Many people fled north, joining Abenakis in Maine, Vermont, and New Hampshire, and siding with the French in future conflicts against the English who had driven them from their homelands. The war left a searing impression on New England and a bitter legacy for Anglo-Indian relations. Despite their victory in what they called the First Indian War, Puritan New Englanders believed that they were being punished by God for a general lack of piety and theological nonconformity. An unprecedented outbreak of witchcraft in Salem, Massachusetts, signaled the further erosion of religious confidence. From the beginning of English settlement in the New World, more than 95% of all legal accusations of witchcraft occurred in New England, a hint of the Puritans' preoccupation with sin and evil. However, most supposed outbreaks of witchcraft before 1692 tended to be very small, closely contained affairs in which the vast majority of defendants were found not guilty by reason of insanity or because of a lack of compelling evidence. What unfolded in Salem was very different. The special court called to adjudicate the cases of a few suspected witches failed to follow proper legal procedures for such cases, allowing victims, defendants, and witnesses to be interviewed at the same time, resulting in an incredible spectacle. Bewitched young girls shrieked in pain, their limbs twisted into strange contortions as they pointed out the witches who tortured them. According to the trial court record, the bewitched girls declared that, quote, 
the shape of one accused witch did oftentimes very grievously pinch them choke them bite them and afflict them urging them to write their names in a book end quote, the devil's book most of the accused witches were older women and nearly all of them were well known to their accusers whereas in the past an admission of guilt meant immediate hanging at the gallows in the salem witch trials confessed witches earned reprieves if they named co-conspirators while those who insisted upon their innocence were judged guilty and sent to be executed. The result was nearly 200 executions. The Salem court hanged 19 accused witches and pressed one man, Giles Corey, to death with heavy stones for refusing to enter a plea. The Salem witchcraft trials displayed New England colonists' enduring belief in the supernatural origins of evil and their gnawing doubts about the strength of their faith. South of New England and north of the Chesapeake, a group of middle colonies were founded in the last third of the 17th century. Before the 1670s, few Europeans settled in the region. For the first two-thirds of the 17th century, the most important European outpost in the area was the relatively small Dutch colony of New Netherland. By 1700, however, the English monarchy had seized New Netherland, renamed it New York, and encouraged the creation of a Quaker colony in Pennsylvania led by William Penn. Unlike the New England colonies, the middle colonies of New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania originated as land grants by the English monarch to one or more proprietors, who then possessed both the land and extensive, almost monarchical powers of government. These middle colonies attracted settlers of more varied European origins and religious faiths than were found in New England. In 1609, the Dutch East India Company sent Henry Hudson to search for a northwest passage to the East Indies. Hudson sailed up the large river that now bears his name until it dwindled to a stream that obviously did not lead to China. A decade later, the Dutch government granted the West India Company, a group of Dutch merchants and shippers, exclusive rights to trade with the Western Hemisphere. In 1626, Peter Minuit, the resident director of the company, purchased Manhattan Island from the Manhattan Indians for trade goods worth the equivalent of a dozen beaver pelts. New Amsterdam, the small settlement established at the southern tip of Manhattan Island, became the principal trading center in New Netherland and the colony's headquarters. Unlike the English colonies, New Netherland did not attract many European immigrants. Like New England and the Chesapeake colonies, New Netherland never realized its sponsors' dreams of great profits. The company tried to stimulate immigration by granting patroonships, allotments of 18 miles of land along the Hudson River, to wealthy stockholders who would bring 50 families to the colony and settle them as surf-like tenants on their huge domains. Only one patroonship succeeded, the others failed to attract settlers, and the company eventually reclaimed much of the land. Though few in number, New Netherlanders were remarkably diverse, especially compared with the mostly English settlers to the north and south. Religious dissenters and immigrants from Holland, Sweden, France, Germany, and elsewhere made their way to the colony. The West India Company struggled to govern the ethnically and religiously diverse colonists. Peter Stuyvesant, governor from 1647 to 1664, tried to enforce conformity to the Dutch Reformed Church, but the company, eager for more immigrants, declared that the consciousness of men should be free and unshackled, making a virtue of New Netherland necessity. The company never permitted the colony's settlers to form a representative government. Instead, the company appointed government officials who established policies, including taxes, which many colonists deeply resented. By 1664, at the beginning of the Second Anglo-Dutch War, New Netherland became New York. James, the Duke of York, quickly organized a small fleet of warships which appeared off Manhattan Island in late summer 1664 and demanded that Stuyvesant surrender. With little choice, he did. As the new proprietor of the captured colony, the Duke of York exercised almost the same unlimited authority over the colony as had the West India Company, although the Duke never set foot there. Like the Dutch, the Duke permitted all persons of what religion soever quietly to inhabit New York, provided they give no disturbance to the public peace, nor do molest or disquiet others in the free exercise of their religion. 
This policy of religious toleration was less an affirmation of liberty of conscience than a recognition of the reality of the most ethnically and religiously diverse colony in 17th century North America. The creation of New York led indirectly to the founding of two other middle colonies, New Jersey and Pennsylvania. In 1664, the Duke of York subdivided his grant and gave the portion between the Hudson and Delaware rivers to two of his friends. The proprietors of this new colony, New Jersey, quarreled and called in a prominent English Quaker, William Penn, to settle their dispute. Penn eventually worked out an agreement that continued New Jersey's proprietary government. In the process, Penn himself became intensely interested in what he termed a holy experiment of establishing a genuinely Quaker colony in America. Unlike most Quakers, William Penn came from an eminent family. His father had served both Cromwell and Charles II and had been knighted. Born in 1644, the younger Penn trained for a military career, but the ideas of dissenters from the re-established Church of England appealed to him, and he became a devout Quaker. By 1680, Penn had published 50 books and had spoken at countless public meetings, but he had failed to win official toleration for Quakers in England. The Quaker's conception of an open, generous God who made his love equally available to all people continually brought them into conflict with the English government. Quaker leaders were ordinary men and women, not specially trained preachers. Quakers allowed women to assume positions of religious leadership. Since all people were equal in the spiritual realm, Quakers considered social hierarchies false and evil. They called everyone friend and shook hands instead of curtsying or removing their hats, even when meeting the king. These customs enraged many non-Quakers and provoked innumerable beatings and worse. Penn was jailed four times for such offenses. Despite his many run-ins with the government, Penn remained on good terms with Charles II. Partly to rid England of the troublesome Quakers, Charles made Penn the proprietor of a new colony of some 45,000 square miles called Pennsylvania in 1681. Quakers flocked to Pennsylvania in numbers exceeded only by the great Puritan migration to New England 50 years earlier. Between 1682 and 1685, nearly 8,000 immigrants arrived. Penn wrote in 1685 that the settlers were, quote, a collection of diverse nations in Europe as French, Dutch, Germans, Swedes, Danes, Finns, Scots-Irish, and English, and of the last equal to all the rest, end quote. The settlers represented a cross-section of the artisans, farmers, and laborers who predominated among English Quakers. Quaker missionaries also encouraged immigrants from the European continent, and many came, giving Pennsylvania greater ethnic diversity than any other English colony except New York. The Quaker colony prospered, and the capital city, Philadelphia, soon rivaled New York as a center of commerce. By 1700, the city's 5,000 inhabitants participated in a thriving trade exporting flour and other food products to the West Indies and importing English textiles and manufactured goods. Penn wanted to live in peace with the Delaware Indians who inhabited the region. His Indian policy expressed his Quaker ideals and contrasted sharply with the hostile policies of the other English colonies. Penn instructed his agents to obtain the Indians' consent by purchasing their land, respecting their claims, and dealing with them fairly. Penn declared that the first principle of government was that every settler would, quote, enjoy the free possession of his or her faith and exercise of worship, end quote. Accordingly, Pennsylvania tolerated Protestant believers of all kinds as well as Roman Catholics. All voters and office holders had to be Christian, however. Penn's government did not compel settlers to attend religious services, as in Massachusetts, or to pay taxes to maintain a state-supported church, as in both Virginia and Massachusetts. Despite these policies of toleration, Pennsylvania was as much a Quaker colony as New England was a stronghold of Puritanism. Penn had no hesitation about using civil government to enforce religious morality. As proprietor, Penn had extensive powers subject only to review by the king— he appointed a governor who maintained the proprietor's power to veto any laws passed by the colonial council, which was elected by property owners who possessed at least 100 acres of land or who paid taxes. The council had the power to originate laws and administer all the affairs of government. A popularly elected assembly served as a check on the council. 
its members had the authority to reject or approve laws supported by the council. Penn stressed that the exact form of government mattered less than the men who served in it. In Penn's eyes, good men staffed Pennsylvania's government because Quakers dominated elective and appointive offices. Quakers, of course, differed among themselves. Members of the assembly struggled to win the right to debate and amend laws, especially tax laws. They finally won the battle in 1701 when a new charter of privileges gave the proprietor the power to appoint the council and in turn stripped the council of all its former powers and gave them to the assembly, which became the only one-house legislature in all the English colonies. Proprietary grants to faraway lands were a cheap way for the king to reward friends. As the colonies grew, however, the grants became more valuable. After 1660, the king took initiatives to funnel colonial trade through English hands and to consolidate royal authority over colonial governments. Influenced by economic and political considerations and triggered by Metacomet's war between colonists and American Indians, the royal initiatives defined the basic relationship between the colonies and England that lasted until the American Revolution. English economic policies toward the colonies were designed to yield customs fees for the monarchy and profitable business for English merchants and shippers. Also, the policies were intended to divert the colonies' trade from England's enemies, especially the Dutch and French. The Navigation Acts of 1650, 51, 60, and 63 set forth two fundamental rules governing colonial trade. First, Goods shipped to and from the colonies had to be transported in English ships using primarily English crews. Second, the Navigation Acts listed colonial products that could be shipped only to England or to other English colonies. These regulations prevented Chesapeake planters from shipping their tobacco directly to the European continent. But they interfered less with the commerce of New England and the Middle Colonies, whose principal exports of fish, lumber, and flour could legally be sent directly to their most important markets in the West Indies. By the end of the 17th century, colonial commerce was defined by English regulations that subjected merchants and shippers to royal supervision and gave them access to markets throughout the English Empire. In addition, colonial shipping received protection from the English Navy. By 1700, colonial goods, including those from the West Indies, accounted for one-fifth of all English imports and for two-thirds of all goods re-exported from England to the European continent. In turn, the colonies absorbed more than one-tenth of English exports. The commercial regulations of the empire gave economic value to England's proprietorship of the American colonies. The monarchy also took steps to exercise greater control over colonial governments. Virginia had been a royal colony since 1624. Maryland, South Carolina, and the Middle Colonies were proprietary colonies with close ties to the Crown. The New England colonies possessed royal charters, but they had developed their own distinctively Puritan governments. Charles II, whose father, Charles I, had been beheaded by Puritans in England, took an interest in harnessing the New England colonies more firmly to the English Empire. In 1676, an agent of the king arrived to investigate whether New England was abiding by English laws. Not surprisingly, the king's agent found many deviations from English law, and the monarchy decided to govern the New England colonies more directly. In 1684, an English court revoked the old Massachusetts Charter, the foundation of the Puritan colony's government. When Charles II died in 1685, his brother James II, a zealous Catholic, succeeded him. He favored Catholics in his court, was married to a French Catholic princess, and alienated a great many of his people who by then were Protestant. In the meantime, he sent royal officials to Massachusetts and other colonies and began the process of incorporating them and other colonies north of Maryland into something called the Dominion of New England. To govern the Dominion, the English sent Sir Edmund Andrews to Boston. Some New England merchants cooperated with Andrews, but most colonists were offended by his flagrant disregard for such Puritan traditions as keeping the Sabbath. Andrews was an aggressive Anglican and vowed to extirpate Puritanism from all of the New England colonies. A visiting Englishman claimed that Bostonians were, quote, great censors of other men's manners, but extremely careless of their own, end quote. Worst of all, 
the Dominion of New England invalidated all land titles, confronting landowners in New England with the horrifying prospect of losing their land. King James II's aggressive campaign to appoint Catholics to government posts created such unrest that a large majority of Parliament invited the Dutch ruler William the Orange to claim the English throne. When William III landed in England at the head of a large army, James fled to France, and William III and his wife, Mary II, James's daughter, became co-rulers in the relatively bloodless, glorious revolution. William and Mary restored Protestant influence in England and its empire. Rumors of the Glorious Revolution raced across the Atlantic and emboldened colonial uprisings against royal authority in Massachusetts, New York, and Maryland. In Boston in 1689, rebels tossed Andrews and other English officials in jail, destroyed the Dominion of New England, and reestablished the former charter government. New Yorkers followed the Massachusetts example. Under the leadership of Jacob Leisler, rebels seized the royal governor in 1689 and ruled the colony for more than a year. That same year in Maryland, the Protestant Association, led by John Coode, overthrew the colony's pro-Catholic government, fearing it would not recognize the new Protestant king. But these rebel governments did not last. When King William III's governor of New York arrived in 1691, he executed Leisler for treason. Coode's men ruled Maryland until the new royal governor arrived in 1692 and ended both Coode's rebellion and Lord Baltimore's proprietary government. In Massachusetts, John Winthrop's city on a hill became another royal colony in 1691. The new charter said that the governor of Massachusetts would be appointed by the king rather than elected by the colonists' representatives. But perhaps the most unsettling change was the new qualification for voting. Possession of property replaced church membership as a requirement for voting in colony-wide elections. Wealth replaced God's grace as the defining characteristic of Massachusetts citizenship. By 1700, the northern English colonies had developed along lines quite different from the example set by their southern counterparts. Immigrants came with their families and created settlements unlike the scattered plantations and largely male environment of early Virginia. Puritans in New England built towns and governments around their churches and placed worship of God, not tobacco, at the center of their society. They depended chiefly on the labor of family members rather than on indentured servants and slaves, although both could be found in very small numbers. The convictions of Puritanism that motivated John Winthrop and others to reinvent England and the colonies dimmed as New England matured and dissenters such as Roger Williams multiplied. Catholics, Quakers, Anglicans, Jews, and others settled in the Middle and Southern colonies, enjoying the rare toleration of religious differences, especially in Pennsylvania and New York. At the same time, northern colonists, like their southern counterparts, developed an ever-increasing demand for land that inevitably led to bloody conflict with the Indians, who were killed or pushed away. By the closing years of the 17th century, the royal government in England intervened to try to moderate those conflicts and to govern the colonies more directly for the benefit of the mother country. Assertions of royal control triggered colonial resistance that was ultimately suppressed, resulting in Massachusetts losing its special charter and becoming instead a royal colony much like the other English colonies in North America. During the next century, the English colonial world would undergo surprising new developments built on the achievements of the 17th century. Immigrants from Scotland, Ireland, and Germany streamed into North America, and unprecedented numbers of African slaves were imported into the southern colonies. On average, white colonists attained a relatively comfortable standard of living, especially compared with most people in England and continental Europe. While religion remained important, the intensity of religious concern that characterized the 17th century declined during the 18th century. Colonists worried more about prosperity than about providence, and their societies grew increasingly secular, worldly, and diverse.